Today we have the pleasure of interviewing Rabina Weatherly. She is an environmentalist and she runs a watershed project in our community. She's also a member of the Queens County Heritage and an active member at Cambridge Narrows Community School. She has received numerous awards for her contribution to environmental issues. She is a well-respected member of Cambridge Narrows. What is your full name? Rovina Claire Weatherly. Did you have any nicknames when you were a child? Not when I was a child, really. Uh, later, I somehow morphed into Robbie and Bobby. <laughs> that stuck for a while <laughs> with a lot of people. So I have one set of people who call me one thing and <laughs> one another. When and where were you born? Right here in Cambridge Narrows, <laughs> in the house where I now live. So you're from here. Did yeah. you, have you lived here your entire life? No, I lived in quite a few other places, but I was here for, for my, well, the first 15 years. Well, I, and then you see there wasn't a school, there wasn't a high school here when in my time, so I, I went away to school to, to Coles Island for my final year of grade 11 and matriculated from there. Um, how long has the property that you grew up on been in your family? Since 1802. Wow. What are the full names of your parents? Victor Cecil Robinson and my mother was Helen Louise Chapman. Did you have any siblings growing up? Yes, I, I'm, a, I'm the middle child. <laughs> I had an older brother Reginald and a younger sister, Louise. When you were young, did you have any chores around your house? Oh yes, many. The, we, as children, were very much involved in the life of the farm, and there were lots of chores to do. So yes, both out, I, I was outside quite a lot. You know, we picked crops, berries and cucumbers and very tomatoes and all that sort of thing, and helped look after the animals and just everything that there was to do, milk cows and so on. It was all at a, at a more primitive level than everything is now, of course. But, and yes, and, and in the house too, there, was, there were six of us all together, so there was, lots of t there was a lot to do. <laughs> How many rooms did you have in your house? Well, uh, I don't know whether, you, you don't count hallways, so maybe about a dozen an old rambling farmhouse. When you were young, did you have indoor plumbing? No. Various systems for water collection. One was on the roof, and sometimes in the wintertime, the drinking water we t took from the lake, which was fine then. And uh, there were springs around that we had our drinking water from, but water for general use was rainwater or whatever, or the lake, which was right beside us. And then later, it was in the 40s when they had indoor plumbing. How old were you when you got your first telephone in your house? Oh, there were always telephones in my time. Mm -hmm. of, 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 a, of a sort, <laughs> I should say. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you got your first job? Well, uh, the first job that came as a check was when I was 16. I, I, there were, they were very short of teachers. And uh, so if you had graduated from high school and matriculated, they gave us what was called a local license and, and we could teach. I did that for one term here before I went to teacher's college. And, but uh, that was the first uh, job that provided a check. As a child, we we earned money for picking berries and, and you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Jobs around the farm. And I used to sometimes, for several years, I built the, built the fire in the school before the kids got there. <laughs> so you'd go into a cold schoolhouse and build the fire in the, in the iron stove. And that's how we were. <laughs> Do you remember some funny things that happened while you were growing up? 
oh, lots of them, but I think we couldn't possibly enumerate <laughs> lots of things that I suppose would seem funny now. Maybe, maybe weren't very funny. <laughs> One time I got locked in the barn with a, a, a very big pig that <laughs> frightened me a lot. I used to have nightmares after that. She was in a shed and I dropped down from a, a, a opening in the roof in the ceiling of that shed from the barn which we played in all the time. I dropped down and I thought she wasn't there. I thought my father had moved her and she was there but she remained asleep and I remained quiet. <laughs> I couldn't get the big rolling door open. So anyway, that was not funny, but it was something that sticks out in my mind. Eventually I heard my father come by and I called to him. And the, the pig that I was so frightened of never woke up. <laughs> but it wasn't funny. <laughs> How has your lifestyle changed from when you were a kid? Well, I guess just about in every way, except for the uh, fact that I am living in the house where I was born and grew up, and the, the surroundings look the same outside and so on to some extent. But life has changed completely with technology. And uh, do you remember the party line telephone? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, after high school, did you go to post-secondary school? Yes, I, 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 I told you I taught for one term on a local license, as it was called, and then I went to teacher's college. <coughs> uh, what did and then I taught for a year, uh, and then I went to university. What did you do in university? Biology. At, at first, biology, it was called, which was everything related to and then it, later on I, I specialized. How long did, it, did you go to university for? Well I didn't do it all in one all in one stretch. I, I did two years at first and then I got an interesting job as a technician with the forestry lab in Fredericton which was just being established and that was very interesting and a very formative time. And so, and, and then after, and I took courses, I worked there for six years as a technician, but I took courses every year at the university. They allowed me to do that and uh, worked off another year. And then after six years, I went to UBC and, and did, uh, finished my bachelor's degree and did a master's degree there. Uh, what did you do when you were younger for, like, activities? Well, I, I suppose we were extremely active outside here, living in this environment. I guess we took it for granted, but we had riches <laughs> in that way. We, we, I, I never see anybody skating now, and I'm so, I, I, that puzzles me because we just loved that. I guess this year it wouldn't have been safe, but... <laughs> uh, we skated when we could, and when when it snowed, they somebody would clear off a rink, and we'd still skate, and we'd have bonfires at night, and so on. And we were just outside all the time. And I particularly was in the woods any time I could be. Did you have any pets? Uh, we were not encouraged to make pets of the farm animals. Uh, it was quite heartbreaking when it came time to sell them, and our Parents didn't encourage us, but of course, inevitably, you did to some extent. You favored some. We had a dog, yes, as well, of course, much beloved. Um, and there were cats. Did you have any, like, uh, traditions on Christmas or...? I suppose just about the same as everybody. We had, uh, we'd go out and cut the Christmas tree on our own place, and uh, that was fun, and uh, we'd go out and look at a tree and say, no, that's not good enough. And then we'd tramp around most of the day and then we'd come back and cut that first tree, usually. <laughs> and uh, Santa Claus came and uh, there were presents. 
and, and lots of good food, and I guess just the same as everybody around here did. Can you tell us about the social changes you have experienced throughout your life? In this community, uh, we, have, we have gone full circle, I guess. Uh, I was born in 1930, which was in the Deep Depression. And as a child, I was not aware that there wasn't any money uh, and that people were out of work and traveling the countryside as they were. Really, I, I was not aware of that because we had lots of good food and a roof over our heads, a comfortable home, and, and so, and, and all this wonderful environment to live in. And so I wasn't aware of any particular deprivation. Uh, but actually, it was a time of great deprivation. There was no money, but people lived as, as uh, grew their own food and, in, in, you know, just about everything. The, the farm, the family farm unit was pretty self-sufficient. We grew, grew our, our own meat and the animals were fed from the plants that we grew and it was a, a, there was a kind of rhythm to things that uh, worked. It must have been very hard work for the parents and so on. And, and some people were a little better off than others, but it, it was not a time of great deprivation. And it was quite a cohesive community. People worked together. People helped each other with work. They called it a frolic if they uh, had Somebody had a, a job to do, a building to build, uh, grain to thresh, wood to saw, or whatever. Th the neighbors would all come in, and then, and then, my father, for instance, would reciprocate and help them. Even the roads were maintained in that way. It was called statutory labor, and and every household, every, I guess, usually the men of the household did several days of work on the roads, keeping the bushes down on the roadsides and whatever. The roads were often like plowed fields, by the way, but, <laughs> but that, that is how, how it was. Um, then electricity came here, and that was about 1937, and that what must be one of the biggest transformative changes that happened Tell us more details about where you lived and why you lived there? Yes, well, I, I explained that I, I went as far as Coles Island for uh, my grade 11 and matriculation. And then uh, after that, I, when I went to teacher's college, that was in Fredericton, and I uh, taught for one year outside of Fredericton at Burton. And then uh, after that, I, I went to uh, UNB in Fredericton for two years, and I was supporting myself, and there, were, there weren't uh, student loans and things like that in those days that I, that I knew about anyway. And so I, was off, I, w I worked part-time in a lab at, on the campus to support myself, and I... Uh, heard about a job that was being offered, a summer job, in the, in the new forestry lab that was being uh, established, forest pathology lab that was being established <coughs> in Fredericton. And I applied for that. And I got that job. And so I lived in, in uh, Fredericton for, I had that job for six years. And as I explained before, I, I uh, worked off another year. Then I went from there, I went to Vancouver, and after I'd finished my master's degree, I went to Calgary and took a job there with the forestry department as a research officer. And they sent me to Ottawa and so on, and I, for training, and that was very interesting. Uh, that was a marvelous uh, time for me. I worked in the Rocky Mountains, and. I thought that was absolutely <laughs> marvelous. I was outdoors, and it was it was terrific. 
<coughs> uh, during that time, I, I was married, and I went to uh, we went to Colorado eventually after a few years, where my husband did his PhD in watershed management, and uh, then from there we went back to Calgary. Then I went to Vancouver. Then we went to Vancouver again. Um, my husband was killed in a, in, a, in a helicopter crash in the north when he was on a research trip. And uh, I was, we were living in Vancouver then. He was a professor at UBC. <coughs> so that was a very difficult time. But Vancouver is a lovely place. And I uh, eventually worked at UBC again, where I, was, I knew people. And I, I taught labs at UBC as a sessional lecturer. Um, eventually, uh, three or four years, four years later, I remarried, and uh, my husband, uh, my second husband, had taken a job in Trimsa, Norway, up on the north coast in the Arctic, in Norway. And he was a professor of fisheries. <coughs> and that was a very interesting experience. We lived there for a couple of years. And from there, we went to Toronto. And, um, and then 21 years ago, came back here when he retired. So I'm back where I came from. Was there a special person that had a big influence on you? Well, I suppose there were there were many who I thought were special people, but one in particular stands out. When I was doing a, a part-time job in a lab at the university at UNB, uh, there was a, a professor, and he was a, he was a scientist. He worked at the experimental farm, and he was the most learned person I had ever met at that time. And he used to come into the lab to visit with uh, someone else who was there. And he was interested in people, and I was a young student uh, working away. They hired me to wash dishes, and then eventually I was doing little bits of their projects, which was very interesting. And, and anyway, he started talking with me, and he was, he was just enormously helpful. I told him I had applied for this job with the forestry lab, and uh, generally speaking, the only the people they were looking for were were male students, and he, he told them, he interceded and he told them that he would teach me anything I needed to know, and it was wonderful. I helped him set up his labs, and he taught three courses at UNB, and I would go in the evenings, and we would prepare and one of them was bacteriology and it was a lot of preparation to teaching bacteriology a lot of lab work and so I got to learn all the techniques because I was going to be working in the forest pathology group and the same techniques aseptic technique and so on are relevant as, as you would do in bacteriology and he, and he talked all the time and he was just a fund of just an absolute fountain of information and I, I think he had a terrific impact on my life because here was someone who knew, as so far as I could see, in my terms, everything. <laughs> and, and he took an interest in, in my development and, uh, and he did. I got the job and he did teach me everything I needed to know for it. And, and of course, there are, there are others who stand out, but he, he came at a very formative time, I guess. And, and I think the importance of mentors is, the, is, is paramount. I think it's just role models and, and uh, mentors, extremely important. Have you ever won any special awards or prizes? Well, I think we touched on it before. Uh, there have been a couple of uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards, one from the province of New Brunswick, and uh, one from the Conservation Council. And I also 
received a very nice award f for the establishment of the Robinson Trail here uh, from uh, that was a federal award signed by Adrian Clarkson, which was very nice at the time, the Governor General. And uh, there were five given out in Canada that year. <coughs> so that gives you some idea of the level of its importance. What organizations or groups have you belonged to? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, uh, Lots of things, <laughs> watershed associations, biology clubs, Council of Canadians. Uh, uh, you could go on and on. <laughs> Are you able to send emails? Uh, do you have a computer? Yes. Do you still have some hobbies that you always had? Yes. Uh, I, I, I'm not into crafts and things at the moment. I used to do some of that, but I'm I'm very interested in world affairs, political uh, affairs, uh, environmental concerns, and all of that. And I don't know whether they're hobbies. They're more than hobbies, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I'm I'm engaged, shall we say. Can, can you explain what the Robinson's Trail is? Well, it's just the, the, the back end of the family farm. Uh, and when we came back here 21 years ago, I began walking where I'd always walked and played and, and so on. And I enjoyed it so much and I thought, and I began seeing that the forests around me were being cut, clear cut, and, and there, there were fewer and fewer such places. So I, I began to wonder if I could share it in some way so that other people could enjoy this. I thought it was enjoyable and important. And uh, Fundy Model Forest, uh, I, I presented the idea to them and, and they uh, thought it was a good idea and they helped uh, by uh, hiring a consultant and we established a trail and, a, and a, an interpretive trail with a brochure. And, and so I have allowed people, to, I wondered if I dared, but I have allowed people to, to go on my property and enjoy it. And they seem to. <laughs> what is the Watershed Association? Well, a group of people who are uh, interested and concerned in the idea of what we think is our greatest resource here, our waterway, and it always has been. It's the reason for the settlement here. It's, it's pivotal to just about everything about the place. And, and historically, <coughs> people <coughs> were drawn here to hunt and fish. You know, the, the Aboriginal peoples used this territory. And it was also the uh, Washtamoic Portage, as they call it. It was the travel route through from what is now Nova Scotia to the Bay of Fundy and up the St. John River to the St. Lawrence and so on. So it's an it's, it's ex extremely significant area. And I suppose my consciousness was raised about environmental issues when I was quite young and I was up in the Miramichi on a fishing trip. And at that time they were spraying for the spraying DDT on the forests here uh, to kill the spruce budworm, which was ravaging the forests. And I suddenly realized that everything is connected in the environment. Everything is connected. You can't do one thing and not affect a whole lot of other things. There was not a sound. It was eerie. There wasn't a sound in the forest. There wasn't a bird, there wasn't a squirrel, there were no mosquitoes, there was nothing, as there would have been. And it, it absolutely shocked me, and I, I think my consciousness was raised right there. And there were very few voices spoke out against D, the DD 
spraying of our forests. Every, most people thought it was an important thing to do. Well, a redworm comes every about every 35 years. If you look on a graph, it's just like that. And so <laughs> the environment was changed each time and, and things happened. Fish were killed, all sorts of things were killed. Uh, it, it, so when a group here, what, uh, there was one time when the lake turned absolutely red and stayed that way for about three weeks or something like that. And people were very alarmed and there were public meetings and so on and so forth. Well, siltation had always been a problem here. We have very erodible soils. They just run red. You notice that if you disturb soil anywhere, the, the, so, the, the water just runs red and that silt is going into the waterway. And it has profound implications because it coats fish eggs, for instance, and they won't hatch and, you know, everything is connected. And, but we, we go on doing these things. Well, a group formed here. Uh, we were not living here then, but we became part of it because we were often here in the summers. Uh, the Washtenaw environmentalists, they called themselves. And when we came back here uh, in, in 1995, it was just uh, after this, I think this, the lake turned red, I think it was 88 or 89, somewhere in there. And people were still thinking about it a bit. And, and we, we, were, we were part of this group and we began collecting data on the system to know, first thing you need to do is to know uh, what you have and what the conditions are and, and so on <clears throat> in order to try to protect something. And then eventually, around 2000, 2001 or two, we got together with people in the upper reaches of the watershed, up in, who were also concerned and interested, up in the Canaan area. Uh, there was a group called the Canaan River Fish and Game Association, and we kind of put ourselves together, and and uh, uh, called called it the Canaan Washtenaw Watershed Association because it's quite a big watershed. It's all one system. What happens up up in the headwaters affects us down here, and what we pour into the river goes on. So it's all very important, and so we we based it on science as far as we could. We collected a lot of data on the conditions here and we, we know quite a lot about it. And then really uh, it seemed the best thing we could do is try to get the message out to everybody because the only way we can protect this system is through the stewardship of everybody. Everybody who lives on this lake and uses this lake needs to be aware of the fragile conditions. And so that's the, the why and how. And we've been, we have public lectures regularly where we bring in speakers on relevant topics. And whether it achieves anything, I don't know. The, the option is there for people to, to learn anyway, if they wish to. And we're connected with the New Brunswick Environmental Network and, and that kind of thing. What do you think is the most important thing that the Watershed Association does? Well, I, I, as I say, we have no jurisdictional clout, obviously. That's the government's role. Uh, we hope to raise consciousness here and there about uh, what needs to be done to to protect what that that's that's the I guess mostly what we can do. We we have various projects. We're now trying to raise awareness about what's going to happen with climate change. I mean it's happening. I mean don't think that the fact that our forests are all cut is not connected to the huge runoff and the fact that we lost our bridges and culverts and, you know, everything is connected. You see, heavy, we're getting heavy, heavy rainstorms 
and very violent, and not that we haven't always had them sometimes, we're having them quite frequently now. And our forests are not there soaking up the water. And just as simple as that, that's a exa simple example of, of... So all we can do is try to get out the word and then people have to uh, pick up on it or not and the results will be there. Of, of what we do. Stewardship is extremely important and it's a common resource so we all have uh, responsibility to protect it. <laughs>